bin Odile Dorge von Candles for Assange Wien, die Mannwache. Und ich möchte euch äh, recht herzlich begrüßen zum Film Ithaca, dem Dokumentarfilm vom Kampf der Familie von Julian Assange, der Vater John Shipton und seine Frau Stella Assange, äh, um das, das Ringen um seine Freiheit, damit er endlich freikommt. Der, der, der Film ist auch deutsch untertitelt und danach haben wir eine, eine Stunde circa äh, mit der Frau D Dr. Deepa Govindarajan Driver. Sie ist eine Gewerkschafterin und Akademikerin und lehrt über staatliche und unternehmerische Rechenschaftspflicht. Deepa ist Mitglied des Nationalen Vorstands der University and College Union und Vorsitzende des Rechtsausschusses. Sie ist Mitglied des Vorstandes von der Haldane Society for Socialist Lawyers und fungiert als juristische Beobachterin im Namen der ELDH und der Haldane Society. Sie hat die Auslieferungsanhörungen im Fall Julian Assange von Anfang an beobachtet und ist mit dem Fall bestens vertraut und kennt auch die Sachen auf Wikileaks, manche Fälle, zu was sie, was sie bewirkt haben und so. Ja, ähm, ja äh, ich kann euch im Moment nur, ah ja, und nur eine kurze Bemerkung noch. Daniel Ellsberg, der berühmteste amerikanische Whistleblower, hat vor ein paar Tagen äh, gesagt, also ein Interview gegeben und gesagt, er hatte damals eine Backup-Kopie vom Material, was Chelsea Manning äh, an Wikileaks geschickt hat. Und äh, deswegen sollte er genauso angeklagt werden wie Julian Assange, weil er hatte auch dieses Material. Ja, ähm, ja. Äh, das ist dazu. Daniel Ellsberg hat in 71, 1971, glaube ich, sind die Pentagon Papers rausgekommen und er hat mühsamst damals äh, Tonnen von, von Fotokopien gemacht, im Verstecken und so, also viel mühsamer als heute mit unserer ganzen Elektronik. Ich wünsche euch äh, einen interessanten Nachmittag. Can we talk about your contact with Julian through his childhood? It's part of the story, I think. It isn't important. part of the story. Yeah. The story is that, I, you know, I am attempting in my own modest way yeah. to get Julian out of the ship. Julian Assange is the hero of our time. He was the darling of the left. All of a sudden, he's a puppet of Russia. My name is John Shifton. I'm Julian Assange's yeah, father. WikiLeaks found that Julian Assange has been arrested. One of the most notorious and controversial figures in custody. Assange will remain behind bars until that extradition hearing, which has been set down for the end of February. I urge the Department of Justice to drop the charges. The maximum jail sentence of 175 years. Because he published the truth. How does it feel to be the father of such a controversial figure, somebody who's known around the world? Was that him on the phone before? Yeah. 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 What are you talking about on a, on a kind of regular basis? If Julian is extradited to the United States to face these charges, he will be the first, but not the last. What are your worst fears? That it just collapses under the strain. It looks as though what journalists do for a living is seen to be a criminal act. Shit to keep it up, man. Thank you. I wish I had your energy, I really do. I'm done, I'm done, I'm done. I'm done. I mean, I'm fucking moving out. Why do you think there's not a great public love and support? This is really, a, truly a good question. What's at stake? If he goes down, so will journalism. But if people walked away from this film understanding you, how would you feel about that? We're here, and this has only come about because we have a child in the ship. Mm. And 
Bunu geleyim ya. And I can see that your first question is that um, what would you tell us of the impact of the case on, on us worldwide and the impact of the work of WikiLeaks on us? Um, so I'd like to take you back um, a few years to uh, the streets of Macedonia, where a German citizen, Khaled El Masri, was seized while he was on a holiday and um, he was picked up by the CIA, vendited, sodomized, tortured, and, you know, beaten up, treated horrendously for several months. At which point in time, um, his captors realized that it was a case of mistaken identity. But even when they realized they had the wrong man, Mr. El Masri was a Muslim man, so they must have got the right person in their view. So they continued to torture him for three more months. And finally, while the CIA and the FBI argued about who had made the case of mistaken identity, uh, Mr. El Masri was suffering and was sent back. And when he was sent back, he wasn't returned with apologies to Germany with some reparation. He was sent in the middle of the night into the streets of the of Albania. When he was <coughs> sorry, when he was um, sent out of the CIA van, he thought he was going to be shot in the back of the head. And it must have been a terrifying moment for Mr. El Masri because here was an innocent man who had committed no crime, who was on a holiday, who found himself in the middle of the war on terror. And when Mr. El Masri was picked up by the Albanian police and sent back to Germany, um, you would think that his ordeal, the suffering that he felt, ended there. And uh, actually it didn't, because the CIA, as we know, through WikiLeaks releases of Cablegate, put huge pressure on the German government, a European government, uh, in a rule of law state, to not prosecute, firstly not to acknowledge Mr. El Masri's treatment, and not to prosecute the eight CIA officials who were involved in that rendition in that illegal rendition. Mr. El Masri spent a number of years trying to seek justice. <coughs> I'm sorry, I have a chest infection. Um, but it was only after he was able to use the WikiLeaks releases in the European Court of Human Rights that Mr. El Masri got some, some measure of justice. The people who tortured him are still at large. And Mr. El Masri is just one case. If you look on the streets of Baghdad, which a video that most of you who are either journalists or experts or um, members of the public should know about, um, and you can find it at collateralmurder.wikileaks.org, you will see how an Apache gunship killed civilians on the streets of Iraq, on the streets of Baghdad. And this was just an ordinary gathering of civilians. And initially, the two Reuters journalists who were in that gathering um, were listed as enemy insurgents. And when Reuters questioned why they had been shot and killed, the United States assured Dean Yates, who was the Baghdad bureau chief for Reuters, that one of the journalists had a long lens camera which had been mistaken for a rocket launcher. And so um, Mr. Yates went away, <coughs> sad that his colleagues had died, but thinking that Namir Nuruddin, who was what, the one of the men who had been killed, had been killed because, you know, it was a tragic mistake. 
There was a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist embedded in the very battalion that killed Namir and Saeed and also killed an unarmed civilian who was known to be unarmed, who was a good Samaritan, who saw the men dying on the road and tried to help put them in his van to take them to a hospital. His children, five and nine, Doha and Sajad, were in the car and were hurt in this incident. Doha had glass shards in her face and eyes. So, and the, the children lost their father that day, as did other families. But all of these people, everybody thought they had died, including the Pulitzer Prize winning journalist, made the argument that the soldiers from America were following the rules of engagement, the standard code of conduct that can be expected to be observed during war within, in that war situation. It was only through WikiLeaks releases that Dean Yates, the Baghdad bureau chief, found out that the United States, when they had shown him the information, initially they had declined the freedom of information requests, then they had shown a clip from that event, but when he saw the whole clip, he realized that the Americans were treating it like some kind of video game. And you, if you hear that video, and also if you scroll down on that page, there is a young American soldier, Ethan McCord, who explains what he saw from the ground. And he is a man of conscience who has spoken up about that crime. But journalists like you and others would not know the truth were it not for WikiLeaks releases. And WikiLeaks was really important in changing the narrative around the Iraq war in terms of the number of actual civilian deaths as opposed to military deaths. And this, these information, this information was vital in denying American soldiers in the, in the Iraqi parliament, denying American soldiers immunity for their acts on the ground and thus help shorten the Iraq war. WikiLeaks releases, of course, as you know, don't just relate to war and war crimes, whether it's in Afghanistan or in Guantanamo or elsewhere. They also relate to toxic waste dumping on the Ivory Coast, corruption in Kenya, um, you know, information about which helps spark the Arab Spring in Tunisia. So WikiLeaks was really, really important. And it was important because, of course, whistleblowers spoke to journalists before WikiLeaks. But WikiLeaks was important because it allowed journalism to keep up with the technological revolution, which allowed um, whistleblowers who knew what was really going on to provide large quantities of data, not just to the New York Times and the Spiegels and the guardians of this world, but also to local journalists like Stefania Marisi in Italy or journalists um, in the Middle East, who understood what was going on in the ground and could look at these bits of information, for example, about the, the collection of waste on the streets, streets of Rome and could give it some local context. So WikiLeaks did the technology, which kept both the whistleblower safe and allowed, very importantly, to ensure that documents are secure. If any of you is a journalist, I'd like you to think of whether your organization has a 100% track record of accuracy. WikiLeaks does, and it does because of the level of care that went into making the publications. And WikiLeaks did a number of other things, with one of which I will just finish on this, which is many organizations, many journalists are in positions where they can be given information. Some publish that information. They publish it once, they publish it twice, maybe. Some are courageous enough to continue publishing it. But when the United States says to their employer, stop, no more. It is very rare that the employer turns back and says, tell us what we have done, which you want us to think is re worth redacting, which has to be removed because it might put lives at risk. But we won't remove things which are actual evidence of war crimes. And this is really, really important because that courage is what distinguishes WikiLeaks from most of the corporate media in the world. 
which is driven by commercial interests, although it all also has lots of good people, which is pressured by the news cycle, which is in a position where they didn't have secure cryptography until after WikiLeaks set up the idea of the secure Dropbox. Many of you will be from familiar with the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists, which did the Panama Papers and the Paradise Papers. The idea of this consortium of people, the idea of having a secure drop, all of these are fundamental to what WikiLeaks brought. So I'll stop there and I'm happy to take the next question. I hope I've done some justice to your question. And I'm, that's really at the heart of this case, because for those of you who are amazed that in Britain, which is a supposed rule of law country, we are talking about the WikiLeaks case, not in terms of press freedom or democracy or many of the other issues which are substantive. Well, it's very intentional. The way extradition work works for um, other European states, as well as for countries like the US, which are, um, you know, considered to have a, a mutual legal assistance kind of agreement within, within the context of um, extradition. The idea is that extradition is considered as a, an expected outcome. So when a requesting state asks for somebody, it is expected that you will extradite them. And then they will go through the process in the other, in the other country. But in your country, in, that is in Britain, we only have five bar, bars, as we call them, five things that we, five or six things that, <coughs> sorry, that we, um, that prevent the extradition. So at the magistrate's court, which is the first instance court, it's really important to realize there is no jury. There is no argument of the facts um, unless cleverly brought in by the lawyers. The arguments are essentially about, does it meet any of the conditions not to be extradited? And one of the conditions that prevents people from being extradited is their own physical and mental health and the conditions in which they would potentially be held. And at the first instance, quite surprisingly, the judge ruled that Julian could not be extradited. I think many of us were surprised, given the way in which the British judicial system has been severely compromised by the Assange case. In the initial hearings that I attended, I was shocked that the main judge who presides over the extraditions, uh, Lady Emma Arbuthnot, who also was involved in sentencing Julian for the bail violation, or rather uh, supervising the bail violation related query. She, her husband is a former defense minister and has um, great ties with the intelligence establishment. Her son runs a company called Dark Trace or rather invest in a company called Dark Trace, which uh, militates against companies like, uh, against organizations like WikiLeaks. She herself has received hospitality from those who are opposed to the interests of Julian and WikiLeaks. And this is a judge who is presiding over the case. And even when this information was disclosed by Declassified UK in the press, I didn't find this information, the press provided this information. She did not recuse herself from the case. She just said, I'm stepping aside. And when that happens, all her old judgments stand. When Judge Vanessa Barretta was reviewing the case, I was amazed at the speed with which attention was paid to push the case through, um, including a comment which I was very surprised to hear in court for her to say that the government expects for this case to be to be um, to be conducted quickly, or words to that effect. And this is really worrying because 
the expectation is that the judiciary is not influenced by the government. I'm also worried that, you know, um, the second superseding indictment, as the US calls it, and this is the real heart of the thing that should worry all journalists, because that superseding indictment <clears throat> criminalizes receiving whistleblown information. It criminalizes uh, disseminating whistleblowing inf whistleblown information. It criminalizes talking to your source. And this superseding indictment was provided several months after the case had actually started being heard. It, in, the, in fact, it was only provided on the first day of the extradition uh, proceedings at the Old Bailey. And this is ridiculous considering that in the months prior to that, Julian had no access to his lawyers at all because of the COVID-19 pandemic and the lockdown conditions in the prisons and the lack of access to even video facilities to talk to his lawyers. So here is a man facing 175 years in a supermax prison where he will have a cell of 12 feet by eight feet with a concrete box with a little hatch through which he is given his food in the day. He will be allowed to speak to his family two times a month for 15 minutes each over the phone on a monitored call with on a call monitored by the FBI. The people who are determining his prison conditions in the US, not post trial, but pre trial, include the CIA and the FBI. And we know from 30 US government insiders that the United States plotted to assassinate Mr. Assange in the embassy. Not only have they plotted to assassinate him, they have obtained all his legal strategy from the Ecuadorian government when he was dragged out illegally in violation of international refugee laws from the Ecuadorian embassy without due process for deprivation of citizenship or asylum. They have also spied not once, not twice, for prolonged periods of time on his privileged legal and medical conversations. So. There is no possibility, given the judicial, um, the questions about the judiciary, given the spying on his privileged conversations, given the obtaining of all his legal strategy, given the attempt to murder him, or the plot to murder him rather than the attempt, it is outrageous that this case is even being heard. And we are now in a stage where we have this fig leaf of a, of a process which pretends that this is, you know, in these grand buildings of the law, that there is something, um, something legal going on, whereas actually it is really a sham. This is not a judicial process when both parties cannot have a reasonable, um, reasonable privileged conversation with lawyers. It is a ridiculous that the United States argued in court, not that they did not spy on Mr. Assange, but that the, the branch of the United States the, um, intelligence that spied on Mr. Assange would make sure it did not provide the information to the DOJ which was prosecuting Mr. Assange. I mean, this nonsense cannot be thought of as anything else. So it is really important that people realize that, you know, in the newspapers here, there are reports about, oh, this stage of the legal process and this step and that step. But all of that is a nonsense. What's really being criminalized is journalism. What's, what's really important to realize is that the UN Working Group on Arbitrary Detention found twice that, and this was in both in situations where Sweden and the UK provided representations to the United, UN Working Group on Arbitrary Detention. They uh, they very clearly found that Mr. Assange's um, human rights were being breached. He was being arbitrarily detained. They also, the UN working, the UN Special Rapporteur on Torture, the former Special Rapporteur, Professor Niels Meltzer, along with two very highly experienced medical experts, as you know from <coughs> previous visits, visited Mr. Assange in the in Belmarsh prison and found that he was 
somebody who's suffering from torture. You cannot address torture while continuing to torture somebody. And that is what is happening in Belmarsh prison. So everything else is a nonsense, it's a facade to cover up the war crimes of the American state and its allies in Britain, in Sweden, in Australia, and of course in Ecuador. I'll stop there and I'll take the next question is, why doesn't Biden take the stand? <coughs> Sorry. Um, well, Biden is known to have described Assange as a high-tech terrorist. And his ally, Hillary Clinton, asked whether she could drone Assange. People like Eric Holder and other have, others have called Wiki, I mean, and Mike Pompeo, of course, on the other side of the coin, has called WikiLeaks a non-state hostile intelligence agency. What does this say when a journalistic organization is called an espionage organization? The journalistic organization's work is surveilled and then it is, um, it is done in such a deceitful and dishonest way that they are, they are prosecuting somebody who, who uh, it, many of you will have heard that out of the 18 charges that the, U, that the US has laid in their indictment, one of them is a conspiracy to commit computer intrusion. And because Assange has had a past in um, hacking and everything else, you will assume it's a hacking charge. And that's what the US likes to present it as. But actually, this refers to a conversation that an individual with the name Nathaniel Frank, NF, had with Chelsea Manning. We don't know that Nathaniel Frank is Julian Assange. There is nothing to prove it in the court. And said, helped Chelsea Manning to, uh, and not even helped, was asked by Chelsea Manning to help her to um, break a password hash, not because she didn't have access to the information already. Chelsea Manning had all the security clear clearances to have access to all the information that she had already leaked. What she wanted to do, according to experts in the court, uh, Patrick Eller, I think was the person, was either to cover her tracks or to download music. Now, it's only a five year charge and this the conspiracy relates to a comment being made, which says, Assange says to, or Nathaniel Frank, they say, says to Chelsea, curious eyes never run dry. And that is deemed as a conspiracy to commit computer intrusion. So this is the level to which the United States government will go, do, go to muddy the waters and to use a range of small smears and turn them into big and absolutely disproportionate smears about an individual, destroy him, remove all avenues of support, isolate him, torture him, bring him close to death where he was considering su suicide several hundred times a day and calling the Samaritan's helpline, keep him in a prison where when he wants to get married, they deny permission, deny permission, deny permission, then they say you can get married. But he says, I'm a Christian, I would like to get married in the prison chapel. And they say, no, you can't get married in the chapel. You can get married in the box room next door. And you are not allowed any photographs because it is a security risk. He is not given his warm clothes for several months because it is a COVID-19 pandemic and I, and I mean, this is not something I have personal evidence of, but this is what was described, that they needed a form, and because the form could not be provided, he could not get his warm clothes. I mean, it is atrocious, and the temperatures were below zero when this happened. This is the kind of mistreatment of a journalist in a maximum security prison. Those of you who have seen the horrors of maximum security prisons all around the world will know that body searches, cavity searches, uh, very few privileges, harsh conditions are very typical of ma maximum security prisons. And that is what this journalist faces while the rest of us are benefiting from a world where this journalist's revelation has changed the course of war. And we all know how bad war is for the people who 
live in the countries where this destruction happens. It isn't just the hundreds of thousands of people who die, it's the millions who are displaced, who lose their family, who lose their lives as a result. And then the migration and other problems that come to other countries. Um, so coming back to your question, which I think I digressed a bit about Biden, and I'm sorry I digressed because I thought that was important. Now, <coughs> Biden comes from an establishment that is willing to criminalize journalism. He is taking a Trump era prosecution and continuing it, not stepping back, but continuing it in order for the CIA and the FBI to wreak vengeance on somebody who exposed their crimes. And it is us who need to put pressure on Biden on the United States to step back. And I am happy to say that Daniel Ellsberg, who received a copy of the WikiLeaks documentation uh, before it was published, has said he wants to be joined, Daniel Ellsberg, the Pentagon Papers whistleblower you know, from the Vietnam War, has said he wants to be joined as a co-defendant in the case. And another journalist by the name of John Young, who runs a, a, a site called Cryptome, which published the WikiLeaks revelations before WikiLeaks because of a technical issue, has, and who has never been asked by the United States government to take that information down. He's an American who has not been asked to take it even down has said he wants to be joined as a defendant in this case because nobody expected, or not nobody expected, many, very few in the American establishment expected that Biden would behave in the same or even worse way than Trump because Biden is, you know, is continuing the legacy of Obama who droned millions of people around the world rather than a legacy of democratic oversight. What is the best way to put pressure on the government? Firstly, I think, if you think back to the apartheid struggle, what was really important was international pressure. So you, as individuals, as journalists, as doctors, as nurses, as professionals, it's really important that you make it, make Assange a topic of discussion, because for too long, the discussion about Assange has been taking place in small pockets. So part of it is, it's a very lengthy case. Lots of people feel nervous to talk about it. Forget about the details of the case. Explain how it criminalizes journalism. Explain how human rights are deprived, and most people can understand that. No matter what they think of Assange or whether they like him or dislike him, most people can see it is wrong to punish somebody who hasn't committed a crime or to punish somebody for a different crime in order to have satisfaction for something else. It is also important to put pressure on the American government to get your MPs, MEPs, the, the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe, which is one of the organizations that has been supportive, to take a stance and a stance when they talk about press freedom. So, you know, you might put a sticker in your window. That might be all you can do. You might go to a barn marker or, you know, speak in a public place. That might be something you can do. You, you might be a professional who has um, a group of people in your university or in your office. You can bring them together to see Ithaca or to see Hacking Justice and get them to talk about the case. Or maybe even forget about Assange. Talk about Guantanamo that 789 Muslim men were held and are still, 20, you know, 40, 37 are still held there without trial or charge. That is what Assange is being prosecuted for, persecuted for both. And, you know, there are many things you can do to change the discourse. You can either look at the Ithaca movie and think, oh, I'm so sad for Stella and then tomorrow I go to Christmas. Or you can do something, and it is time that people did something, because this is not about Assange, this is about us, and the kind of world we want our children to have, the kind of society we want to live in, where people are not held in, you know, what is the difference between us and all the states we criticize, which are dictatorial states, which hold people in prisons for crimes they did not commit? What, where is the civilization? Where is the rule of law? Where is the democracy? 
it's completely absent and you can either give up and say i can't do anything it's terrible or you can be part of the change that is half that will have to happen in the world because without that there is no point in your existence You know, I think there is a combination of things that are reigning in the background. Of course, the intelligence services have their own uh, objectives, but we should not remove responsibility from those who are in democratic positions of power. They are all uh, willingly being complicit in this huge crime of torturing somebody. It is a crime, and so. Um, of course, the intelligence services are involved because they are trying to cover up the very crimes they committed everywhere in the world, and they are used, you know, to committing these crimes and undertaking regime change activities through organisations, whether it is USAID or other organisations that have been used, have been um, infiltrated, used, whatever you want to call them, to provide regime change agendas. So these are, um, you know, I, I, I see your question, which says, could I confirm if the intelligence services are, are in charge in the background? But I don't, I think, of course, the intelligence services are involved because they are, um, they are trying to hide their crimes. But it is also the responsibility of the lawyers, the judges, the, the judicial community in Britain, which is staying silent on the fact that one of their colleagues privileged conversations not just one of their colleagues but several of their colleagues privileged conversations have been spied upon why is the legal community not up in arms and saying this is a crime this should not be allowed because each of them finds it more convenient to find you know if it had been somebody if this had been done to a journalist today in russia or in turkey they would all be willing to say something about it but when it happens, when they are involved in doing it, they find excuses to hide their own complicity. And many journalist organizations, and I want to say this, please look at the journalist organizations, how many of them talk about charges in Sweden. There is not a single charge in Sweden ever raised in the nine, seven to nine years that that took place, that investigation. It was kept in preliminary investigation stage for over seven years, giving nobody justice. And yet, even to this day, people will talk about him being holed up in the embassy as though seeking refuge is a crime. And these are all the people who will talk about refugees coming in boats and no, no, we must not. But when there is a refugee in your own country, sitting in an embassy, a non-viable space, the British government will be involved in pulling him out of the embassy. So it is really important that we don't just say, oh, it's the intelligence, what can we do? There are spooks behind the scenes. Yes, there is the secret power. As Stefania Malisi's new book, I want to show it to you. It's a fantastic new book. Um, where is it? Uh, it's on my wall uh, somewhere. I'll, I'll show it in a second. But there are, you know, there, there are two very important books that have come out now. One by the Italian journalist Stefania Malisi called Secret Power. I urge you to read it. It's like a detective novel to start with. It's worth reading. It's, it's interesting. It's fun. But it's also very revealing. The other book, for those of you who are seriously minded, is the book by Professor Niels Melzer on the trial of Julian Assange, which is available in German and English, whatever is you, most convenient to you. Please read it, because understanding the facts of this case, of this historic case, because this is the political persecution of our generation. This is the Mandela of our generation. And it is really important that people don't just say, oh yeah, <laughs> you have to do something.